Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Berman, the host of the Cyber Hero Adventures show. So I want to begin by asking you a question. Based upon that cool, high-energy introduction, how grumpy are you that I'm just kind of sitting here? Well, don't answer that until you see the source of my superpower, because many people have asked, why am I doing this? Well, here you go. Conferences. I've been to 53 cybersecurity conferences in just over three years. Uh, I am uh, 63, going on 64 years of age, and I wear a superhero costume. Why my wife thinks I'm batty, but what are you going to do? Stay tuned. You might see that superhero costume in use uh, because I did a show recently on sustainability and end of life uh, document destruction and things like that. And I went into a Best Buy in costume. So who knows what's going to happen? But I can tell you one thing that's going to happen is we're going to have a great opportunity to hear from one of our amazing guests, Herb Reutboy. Hey, Herb, how you doing? Hey, Gary, how are you? Good. It's Thanks. great to be here. Thank you so much for risking your reputation. I mean, like, things aren't going well for you or what? <laughs> Sometimes we have to set our standards at a reasonable level. Reasonable. Okay, good. That way they're, they're, uh, they're attainable. But um, really, on a little bit more of a, a serious note uh, for our audience, uh, Herb is just an absolute rock star, a data scientist. He's the chief data scientist at a great company, uh, you know, Mindcast. Um, and uh, on a personal note, uh, I would uh, consider you a friend. I, I, are you up for that since this is live? I'm, I'm, I'm certainly up for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you actually have no choice. Um, so, <laughs> at some point, we might actually be able to be in the same room together. You know, from your mouth to God's ears, it's really interesting you said that because it's when COVID hit, I, I made this pivot from being a reporter, uh, you know, on conferences. That was kind of my my beat to doing a video show, you know. And one of my big takeaways from this experience is that people actually do have torsos. <laughs> no, I end right here. Yeah. There's nothing, left. <laughs> nothing below that. Yeah, exactly. Well, the part we want mostly is your head. Um, you know, and that, and that kind of, uh, you know, will work out, uh, you know, very well. Uh, exactly. And by the way, I think I've mentioned this to you. Let me do the humor and then you focus on cyber security and science and all that. That way we stay in our lanes. Sure. Oh, okay. No, you, you, it's okay to, to have a personality and be funny. And I actually love that. One, one of the uh, missions of our show is to kind of lead this industry on what we're calling the big pivot from fear, uncertainty, and doubt to fun. Now, there's a lot to be afraid of and uncertain about and doubtful. So, you know, there's no, and this is serious stuff. You know, we all know that and we do treat it that way. However, there is an opportunity to just kind of, take a breath, you know, and give people some kind of psychological air to breathe and, uh, you know, to know what is fun for people. And I know one thing about you that's fun is your dogs. <laughs> they have left the room. I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. Well, may maybe later we'll, we'll do like a, a, a little uh, pop in. Uh, we have some breaking news here. Uh, Stand by. The White House announces the executive order to improve the nation's cybersecurity. What? What what luck having you Herb? You know, you know anything you know anything about this stuff or what? Yeah, I, I know a little bit about it. Um, I think it's really important. I think it's it's doing what I think needs to be done. And I hope it's the start of really paying attention to this. Um, the, the the general idea of it is uh, we have to pay more attention to uh, cybersecurity. We've been neglecting it, and we've been falling victim. Um, the Colonial Pipeline uh, hack, for example, apparently cost them $5 million in ransom and uh, a week's worth of revenue and uh, untold reputation damage. It caused fear up and down the East Coast. Will we have enough gasoline to be able to get through, or, or do I have to... Uh, steal it from my neighbor's car. Um, and back in 2001, the head of the uh, National Institute for Engineering went before Congress and said, essentially what's in this order, folks, we've got to pay more attention to cybersecurity. We've got to pay more attention. You can hear the dog, I, I think. 
I, I can hear the dog, but we're listening to you. Don't worry. <laughs> we have to pay more attention to to protecting the internals of our of our uh, networks. Uh, and that was twenty years ago, and we're still suffering. Wow. I mean that that's a really really important insight and statement. You know what 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 is the causation of that? Or what why why do you assess it that way? I, I think in part uh, because we've thought that all we really need to do is to protect the borders of our of our networks. We we have to protect the edges, and if if we're protected by uh, a a uh, virtual private network. Uh, well, nobody can get into that, and there won't be a problem. We don't have to worry about the internet. Right. What we found with that and solar winds and, and many others is the hack. It's not may the hackers get in; it's when will the hackers get in. You, you know, they, I, I just they only have to be right once. Forgive the interruption, but take this is Wilbur Wannacry, um, you know, a, a a character that our team created to kind of anthropomorphize ransomware, which now is, you know, uh, just increasing by, I heard something like 300% over year over year, something along those, those lines. And they, and uh, you just uh, stated that they, they did pay the ransom. Um, what message does that send to other criminals? Hey, come get it boys. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, that, that's kind of my take. But on the other hand, you know, the business operations and the disruption, you know, is unbelievable. So I can certainly see why they did it. Yeah, I mean, look, they they make money um, allegedly with the blessing of the uh, Russian government, or at least with the compliance of the, uh, apparently of the Russian government. I take that from from news reports. I don't have any independent evidence of that. Um, but it works. Uh, it's cheap. And if we don't have uh, good defenses against them, they're just going to succeed and just keep on doing it, uh, especially when they know they're going to get paid. For real. And, and Mike, I just wrote something really insightful here, you know, wait until the power grid gets attacked in the next 90 days. I for those of you who don't know Mike, uh, he's just an absolute rock star. And, and Mike, if you want to uh, you know, join the stream when we have our rapid responders, you're welcome uh, to do that. Um, so, you know, uh, Mike has a very uh, important and interesting, um, you know, insight uh, into all this stuff, um, you know, because he uh, has long history, you know, re regarding uh, penetration testing and things like that. Um, you know, so... Uh, he also writes that VPN is rice paper. <laughs> I, mean, I, I hope he's exaggerating. <laughs> uh, I don't know, but he just <laughs> put a laugh, laugh out loud here. So I, I think we got this thing going here with Mike. Um, you know, but um, it, it's interesting too because uh, Ron says, you know, this could be a Futurama sort of moment. Uh, alluding to you know the the comic character, so that's pretty interesting as well. Yeah. By the way, feel free to send your uh, your thoughts, your questions to Herb and our other guests. You know, using the comments uh, tab uh, in this, and uh, that'd be cool. And uh, we have another uh, super smart guy, uh, Ken uh, Ken Muir agrees. Uh, you know, with that. And you know, one of the things I love about everyone who's responding right now is they use punctuation. You know, and <laughs> it, 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 doesn't it just like yeah. You know, and I I, um, I have a version uh, of that, too, that you already saw a little bit. And so the next time Herb says something really cool, we'll use it. So you have to say something really cool in response to uh, starting to, you know, unpack a little bit this, uh, you know, White House uh, executive uh, order. Um, there is a, a very interesting uh, kind of a summary uh, at the end of that executive order. And, and, and this is the first... Uh, you know, kind of topic that they were talking about, you know, removing barriers uh, to sharing information. This is a big deal for our show. It's it's one of our core missions. It's a big deal for the mm -hmm. ISACs also. Um, is this a game changer? I mean, do you think this is going to make it a lot easier to share by getting rid of, rid of some of the contractual things and regulations, that kind of stuff? I think it begins to model what needs to happen. Um, a big reason for uh, organizations' failure to cooperate with one another is they had to protect their information. They were legally bound not to release things. Well, 
the government saying, uh, stop your legally bound worries. Uh, we need to share the information and go ahead and do it. Uh, removing those barriers is, is, is an essential first step so that people can feel uh, free to cooperate. Now, the important thing about this, about this order from that perspective is it doesn't govern all of cybersecurity. It governs uh, government contractors, but right. it requires government contractor suppliers to be partial, to be involved in it. Once you do that, you've got just about everybody who's involved with anything with computers in this country. Yeah, and you know the CMMC, you know, uh, initiative in the Department of Defense. They have some three hundred thousand or so contractors, subcontractors, you know, and lots of uh, attack vectors, you know, for for uh, for criminals. Yeah, yeah, and and we've been learning about more uh, attack vectors. I mean, the the reason I got involved in all this has to do with artificial intelligence and and machine learning and how the bad guys use it to uh, to get what they want and how we need to use it in order to defend against bad guys using it. Well, uh, I, I love that you said that, forgive the interruption, but uh, you wrote a great book, Algorithms Are Not Enough, um, you know, that uh, delves into, you know, these uh, types of uh, topics. What, what uh, would, uh, you know, some high level kind of takeaways from artificial intelligence or machine learning um, fit into this executive order? Like, how, how do you see it so far? Yeah, well, one of the things that they point out is that they need to improve our uh, cyber resilience or cyber uh, ability to detect intruders and to detect uh, the presence of malware and so on. Um, nobody has the attention span to be able to monitor your system 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, and, and, and be thorough and, and complete. Computers do. Computers rely on human training to be able to uh, help them to identify what is important uh, in the signal. They can't do it all by themselves, but um, they don't take vacations. They don't go to the bathroom. They don't uh, miss things. And what we need is more uh, intelligence to be able to uh, leverage uh, human capabilities. Well, speaking uh, there's of... There's also... Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry for the interruption, but I was you gave me a great segue. I was going to say, speaking of more intelligence, I want to uh, introduce one of our rapid responders, uh, Scott Schober. Hey, Scott, how you doing? Hey, how you guys doing there? Hey, Scott. We're great. Hi. Good to yeah, see you there, Herb. Good to see you, Gary. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for uh, for popping in. Um, you know, so what, what's your uh, initial take on what Herb was just beginning to e expound on the role of AI and ML in, in cybersecurity? And, and Herb, forgive me, uh, we'll go back to what you were saying right after this. It's fine. These yeah. conversations tend to go where they should go anyway. <laughs> cool. Well, I, I think I think he had a really good point there, and I think AI. In, in combination with machine learning is really going to be fundamental in fighting this battle. I, I mean, it's, I, I'm, I'm optimistic when I hear things that they're actually taking positive steps and pushing this executive order through, especially when I think back in you know, the recent colonial pipeline disaster and solar winds and, and breach after breach after breach, which is a lot of it's targeting the U.S. And, and critical infrastructure and the federal government, I think, is is realizing, hey, this is a bigger problem than we thought. We can't just keep going on this way. And you, to see that the they're willing to share information between the private and public sector is important. More data, more information, and to Herb's point, that can be harnessed and effectively used with artificial intelligence to learn a lot more. And and a lot of it's the response time now. Is, is adjusted and much shorter when you're properly handling that big data. And when you have actionable items, I think that's powerful. Now you can stop cyber criminals much quicker and prevent much more long-term damage. And we see even with the Colonial Pipeline, I look at that as a recent example, uncertainty, panic, gouging prices, supply chain, logistics questions all come to mind. It's all the unknown that causes these problems. 
harnessing some of that big data with artificial intelligence brings it in tighter. So decisions and, and effective decisions can be made quickly as opposed to dragging it out. And we look with Colonial Pipeline, pay the ransom, don't pay the ransom, how much, negotiate it, what's it going to affect, how long before we can get back online, so on and so forth. Those type of things are never good when it's, in, in my opinion, in the government's hands. They need to be able to make quick, decisive this, you know, decisions that will lead us to solutions quicker for the safety and good of all people. Yeah, and this is the second key takeaway from the executive order that you know we popped up on the screen here, which which maps perfectly with with kind of what you're saying, Scott. And Herb, what do you think about this? You know, modernize and implement, uh, you know, the standards. This is exactly what has to happen. Uh, I think that there is not necessarily uh, widespread widespread recognition of exactly what that means in terms of behavior. And that's something that we can help them to, to understand. But um, we've got to modernize it. It's got to be taken seriously. We can't let it sit because we're seeing that the uh, economic impact of these cyber attacks is just tremendous. One, one third of the, of the fuel in the country was just shut down for a week. Yeah, uh, this um, from what I understand, and maybe maybe the two of you can can clarify this, um, that this vulnerability, this particular target was was not targeted, was actually kind of found just through scanning and things like that. Is that have you guys heard about that or is there anything to that? I haven't heard with any certainty yet. I've heard a lot of rumors and speculation. It could have been this could have been that. So I always hate to comment until I know a little bit more certainty i guess how it happened i think it, it is probably safe to say though in a general statement if you look at critical infrastructure there are a lot of vulnerabilities across the board and there's a lot and and, and to the to reason why because there's a lot of legacy systems and, and again we don't want to fault you know the energy sector or any particular sector they, they're tied based upon you know certain regulations of course with the pipeline there really was no regulations from a cybersecurity spec perspective, which is scary, where the energy industry has a little bit more and with electric and things like that. My concern is, is when you start to look at systems like old legacy systems in refineries, there's 135 refineries across the nation, very vulnerable. Those have very specific consequences if they're targeted and hacked. Um, and, and the list goes on and on, uh, obviously nuclear and coal and so on and so forth. So I think looking at what this this the bigger statement what this does is important because it's addressing the software uh supply chain security there's a safety review board um how do how does the nation respond when they are attacked those type of things there's too much uncertainty now this gives a nice streamlined approach which will allow it to be addressed going forward and i think that that's good to see and there was some hard work behind the scenes. So people certainly should be applauded. Now, hopefully the execution side will happen. And again, where there'll be the sharing of information. Because a lot of people, I think, and myself included, before learning about this pipeline, I, I was assuming a lot more of this was um, on the government's hands. But 85% of the pipeline is actually privatized. Right. That's interesting. So you've got private companies that are very segmented and they don't all spend the same and do the same when it comes to cybersecurity. So basically, let's get, every, get everybody on the same playing field so we can work together to solve these problems going forward. Well, uh, and I think that, in addition uh, to that, we, we need priority. Yeah. Uh, it's not that people didn't know that these things needed to happen. It was one of these days we'll get to it. Yeah. Yeah, and now because of the the recent big ones, you know, uh, Solar Winds, uh, Microsoft Exchange, Colonial Pipeline. I just think this whole topic has become much more real to the average citizen, you yes. know, which, is, which has put pressure on Congress and stuff to to, to do something about it. So um, Jerry writes a very interesting question here, like who regulates, you know, the the regulators, and he also um, said a little bit earlier. Um, you know, do we have the right person to lead this effort? And and I, I have uh, been uh, sort of listening and learning from a few different people. Ann Newberger, uh, another uh, person, uh, Jen, uh, her name uh, slips me right now, but they're in, in senior positions in the administration. 
what's your impression about who, who's going to lead this? You know, do we have the right people in place? Can we get the right people in place so that this is truly a game changer? I, I don't know about the, the particular personnel that are involved, but I think it's bigger than any group of people. Um, I think that uh, the most important thing is for Congress to get behind this and to say, yeah, we need, we need regulations, we need standards. We can't rely on the pipeline, for example, or the power grid or whoever to say, oh, I'm going to take my investor money this week and invest it on this. That may decrease my share price next week, but in the long term, it'll protect us. That's not an adequate method for deciding that we need security. Yeah. I think in addition to that, I think the fact that they're putting together a cybersecurity review board that is, again, a mixture of government leaders, but also private sector industry leaders. Putting that together is powerful um, so they could be proactive and hopefully preventing things, but also the learning curve. I think after every incident happens, I go back, I always think about Target. What happened after Target and the major data breach that everybody knows about with credit cards? Things happen. Laws got enacted, oversight, and it made credit card, overall credit card processing and safety standards and cybersecurity and legislation, insurance, it all started to happen and glue together to make it a better, safer world. The same thing hopefully is going to happen here. And they, they mentioned, I think, in the executive order, they're going to model it after the National Transportation Safety Board. So when there is a, a plane, unfortunately, that crashes and goes down, there is a careful investigation. The findings of that is shared. And when that happens, it makes things better and safer going forward. The same thing needs to happen here. We see Colonial Pipeline. We need to learn something from this, everybody, private and, and, and government, so it doesn't happen again in another particular area. Very important. That, that's really interesting, Scott. I didn't think about it that way. I thought about it as, uh, oh, they're going to review. Well, they don't really need to review because once you've done your forensic work, you know what the answer is. But, but you're, what you just said was they're going to have at least a, a bully pulpit to mm -hmm. broadcast what happened here and pressure uh, every interested party to, to, to live up to that. I think, I think that's a really good insight. Yeah, and also, I mean, something you said earlier, Scott, I, I think um, bears uh, a little bit further investigation, which is uh, eliminating the barrier, the legal, the contractual barriers to sharing information. You know, it's easy to understand why a company would want to hold on to its IP, also easy to understand why they wouldn't want to disclose a cyber attack. I mean, my goodness, you know, the stock price goes down, you know, it, it's, it's bad. Um, and so by reducing the risk associated with disclosure, sounds like um, that's a pretty good idea. Yeah. yeah. And I think there's also going to be the, the fallout of this, in essence, if I understand the government's perspective, is there's going to be pressure for the private sector to get things right and upgrade their cybersecurity posture, let's say. And there's no real good incentive or motivation at the moment necessarily for, you know, if you look at a small business owner that's struggling through this pandemic or you that's look it. at a particular sector, this is a little different now. Now there's going to be a little bit more of a pressure point. Let's work together. Everybody rise to the occasion. Is there going to be money that has to be spent? Yeah, sure. But there's also going to be an exchange or sharing of information to strengthen the cybersecurity so everybody can really put up a good defense and work together. Well, they're not just defending themselves and their company. They're defending the country. Yeah, true. Yeah. And um, so, you know, a, a way that Jerry is uh, offering a suggestion uh, that you see on your screen here, um, you know, experts in cybersecurity, you know, and, and one of the uh, incredible sort of uh, privileges uh, for my kind of Forrest Gump journey into the digital universe is there uh, are hundreds of thousands of, of wonderful unsung cyber heroes who toil in anonymity to keep us safe, you know, at work and home, at school. And, and now seems the time to shine the light on them, to elevate them, oh. to give them the respect that they deserve. Um, if a cybersecurity incident happens, don't blame people because, you know, the only time you hear about this stuff is when the criminals win. 
you know, and not anymore. That's a core mission to, to us. So really on behalf of a grateful digital universe, so thanks to the two of you and thanks to all the members of our audience who are fighting these uh, incredibly difficult battles. And I think he's right that uh, you know, the politicians can lead the way and make the space for something to happen, but they're not the experts on this. They're not, they're not, they're not the, the people who sit on NTSB. Those are experts who really know what they're doing and uh, really can uh, analyze and tell the story of what happened and what needs to happen. And, and that's, that's the, the key insight there, what needs to happen based on what we know did happen. And I think too, it is very important in the cyber industry and probably similar in other industries, the advances in technology is extremely rapid. And oftentimes the government will follow change or push change. You need somebody that's in the trenches that understands artificial intelligence, machine learning, the implications on both the good side and the bad side. So. I often think when I, when I stop for a moment, put a different hat on and say, I have to think for a moment, what is a cyber criminal going to do? What would a hacker do? How would I play this out? And then you start to identify the vulnerabilities where they're going to try to exploit. That type of mindset needs to be applied here so you could stay ahead and anticipate the worst, hoping it doesn't happen so you could shore up those vulnerabilities so nobody can exploit it. But if there's not forethought on that, it can't be something following by new legislation and rules and regulations and fines and hurting companies. That That's probably not going to work very well in this case. Well, plus, I mean, to build on that, you know, one of the things that's widely discussed, you know, in the cybersecurity and IT ecosystem is the shortage of talent, you know, work, workforce development. And um, uh, Mike Jones just, uh, you know, opined on something incredibly uh, interesting, you know, if, if the government would hire you know, more ex-hackers and, and uh, have some type of uh, a program, you know, to encourage them to, to be helpful compared to what they were doing, uh, that seems like a ready-made you know, talent pool, you know, and, and I happen to know that, know that Mike is leading a really uh, important uh, kind of breakthrough uh, program called Prevent, where uh, he deals with, uh, you know, young, younger kids who may have had some trouble, you know, regarding uh, technology or hacking and stuff like that, and kind of steers them into, uh, you know, being um, a defender, if you will. I think that's a great point that, that Mike brings up, and I, I look at it this way, Typically, and this is a general statement, so hopefully no one holds me to it. Typically, the average white hat hacker, the guy that's hacking and helping secure things, an ethical hacker trying to make things secure and better, they find the weaknesses and expose it. Um, they're not necessarily your atypical business person or your college degree or so that. Right. somebody exactly. that, that likes to explore and, and get into computers and find what makes them work, what breaks them. Those type of people that maybe if they went off the deep end a little bit or got distracted with illegal activities that could be brought into a positive world that gives them reinforcement for doing good and they see change, they're up for the technical challenge more than the paycheck. So thinking about innovation and challenging somebody that may be heading off to the wrong side, those are the people that you want on the good side to be helping and supporting this effort to win the war against cyber criminals. And speaking of, you know, good side, uh, let's uh, introduce rapid responder, Ken Muir. Hey, Ken, how you doing? Good, Gary. How are you? Hey, Scott. Hey, hey how are you doing, Ken. Good good. To see you guys. Hey, thanks a lot for uh, for joining us. So what do you what do you think about uh, what you've heard so far? Uh, I, I think it's phenomenally important. And the content so far has just been absolutely uh, uh, bang on. Uh, one of the things I wanted to comment on, actually, was uh, both uh, Herb and Scott have talked about was the fact that, you know, one of the things that I've noticed over the years is that, you know, in the absence of governments being able to provide direction and help and, and coordination between private and public sector, the, the course seems to be let's just find companies into oblivion uh, and teach them a lesson, which is not really helping anybody. It's all like a, a blue on blue situation, you know, where we're not able to take the high ground against the enemy. So let's just take it out on each other. <laughs> I, just don't really understand how that, I don't really understand how that's a thing. That's like a thousands of year old you know, remedy for something that's, you know, very modern, multidimensional and multi, uh, you know, it, it's just a, a very, very complex 
uh, situation. And it, you know, the point that was made earlier is it's going to take more than government and it's going to take more than the private sector. Uh, I think penalizing companies for disclosing the fact that they've been breached is not a good strategy either because one thing everybody I think will agree on this is that you need data. You need as much data as you can possibly get from everywhere you can possibly get it from to be able to formulate solutions. And if you're penalizing people for providing that data, you'll never get it. So, you know, I see statistics, for instance, on how many uh, ransomware victims there are in, in Canada, as an example. Well, you know, those are those, that's subjective because not everybody reports that. Nobody wants to report that. But it's not, it, you know, and it's not helping us uh, it, to be able to solve this problem. So that was the, the big key takeaways I got from uh, from Scott and Herb. So. And also, just uh, Ken, to, to build on this for a moment, you have a, a kind of unique perspective on this because, you, of course, you live in Canada. And um, you're actually uh, recently, uh, you and your colleagues uh, were awarded a very important uh, kind of government contract. Uh, can you can you describe your mission there? Because it sounds to me anyways, like what the White House did with this executive order is kind of what you're charged to do for for Canada or for some of them, can you? Yeah, I mean, I I, uh, I started out in this business in the early '90s, and uh, you know, just like everybody, I was very fascinated with the concept of hacking, and I built my own uh, network of uh, systems, and I used to play around with a couple of CDs full of hacking tools. Uh, it was pretty cool because there's no instructions with those things; you just need to figure them out. But the the point being is, is that you do learn a lot about sort of the way these people think to a large degree. Uh, my skills are nowhere near where they need to be today. Like I'm marvel at the fact that these what these guys are capable of doing today. Uh, but you know, with that background and 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 uh, your network architecture skills, uh, the role is to really make sure that we're standing up the equivalent of an FBI office in a state to make sure that it has all of the you know sort of technical uh, people, uh, everything that we normally would put in as part of a framework is to make sure that those controls are really tight and it is governance around those things because it is really important i mean i read every day that some police force somewhere has been hacked and there's stuff out on the dark web somewhere and it's it, it just happens all the time uh, i've always been a voracious reader of uh, it's, it's everything cyber uh, but in the last couple of years it's, it's just so much it's overwhelming the amount of information we're getting on, on people getting hacked and breached and stuff uh, and you know the thing that really concerns me the most is that um <laughs> Our industry is so full of people telling you that they have the um, the panacea for fixing cyber issues. You know, it's going to solve world hunger. So why are people still getting breached? There's obviously something fundamentally broken about the way we're going about this. Uh, so again, to the same point, like it's going to take a collaboration of both the public and private sector to, to solve this. Well, interestingly, I think the order has some of the answer to that. Uh, in that I think most of the focus on cybersecurity is at the border. Uh, if it, what, Once somebody gets into my network, they're free to move around. That's, I think, the big risk because you cannot be perfect at blocking the edges only. You have to have tools that will look inside as well as uh, protect, the, uh, protect the, the edges. Yeah, I mean, it, there's also things like, you know, if, when I was... Uh, doing this way back in the 2000s, like our, our concept was if your data resided in this network, everything outside of that was untrusted. Even if it was your, still your organization, you might have hundreds yes. of locations around the world, but they were completely untrusted as far as you're concerned because you can only protect so much of your organization. Um, yes. So I, I'm really hoping that this is going to be, be a big change. You know, it really concerns me when I read stories like, uh, you know, some DOD uh, individual lost a, a laptop with a 500,000 names of, you know, previous and current uh, veterans. Like, why are you carrying this thing around? Like, why? Why are you doing this? Why are you allowed to do this? It just doesn't make any sense. So there's a lot of things that need to, to be fixed. I think a fair amount, too, to, to your point, maybe, Ken, is... We still have an address. I'd say we, in general sense, the basics. It's still a human problem. A lot of the mistakes made One. in cyber. 
And I think Gary does a great job in really amplifying and helping us all appreciate that. The basic stuff, if, if we're not creating strong passwords, everyone hates talking about that, reusing passwords, yet more than 50% of people still reuse the same password across multiple sites. What is that telling you? That's why somebody carrying a database of a half a million you know, people on their laptop and gets lost and gets compromised because they don't do the basics. They're too complacent. Uh, probably won't happen to me. I'll figure it out. <laughs> it does. It's too late. So we have to think with a different mindset. And to some degree, we have to force things. And, and what do I talk about? I, we, we talk about ransomware. I think after this recent ransomware attack, all companies, and, and myself included, I, I'll put myself on the chopping block, and we're, we're doing this, change your backup plans, increase the number of backups that you do, have them removed and stored off-site in a locked safe and do it regularly and have a pattern, just like you get your hair cut, you brush your teeth, you get your gas, you wash your car, have that same pattern for backup. So when we think about that from a standpoint of cybersecurity, it's not that hard to do. It becomes part of life. That we can accomplish, I think. If we can do those basics, then we can probably slowly grow and really stop the more serious threats and it's going to be more proactive and make a difference well look at this very well thought, uh, thought out excuse the interruption uh, look at this uh, well thought out uh, statement uh, that jeff provided uh, thanks for this uh, jeff and it it really i think um amplifies you know what we were uh, what you were saying herb earlier that you know my gosh you know 20 some odd years ago we were having it seems similar if not the same discussions, you know, is the recent event and is this executive order, in in your opinion, uh, collectively, um, a game changer? Will this matter? I think it'll matter. I don't think it's a game changer so much as a uh, a reminder and pressure to prioritize this. I mean, it's not that people don't know. Uh, this look. There's a lot of progress that has to be made on building better tools. But even the tools we have, uh, as Scott said, they don't do proper backups. I mean, our company does that kind of stuff. And that's why we're, that's a service that we provide to back up into the cloud. It's, it's, it doesn't have to be done that way. It can be done anyway. Take things offline. So if you get hacked, if you get uh, uh, ransomware, you just throw that disk away and put in the one that you had before that what before it was hacked. I mean, there are very straightforward solutions to many of these things that people just don't have the impetus to use. We saw an earlier earlier company and we wanted to be in, in knowledge management to help people understand what they were. And, and we sold exactly one system because the answer was always, yeah, that's great. One of these days we'll get around to it. Cybersecurity cannot be one of these days. I think also to making sure you have strong incident response plans also uh, factors into this as well because nobody nobody should be assuming today that they will never get breached. But absolutely what right. Are you, what are you going to do about it, right? Um, and yes. uh, that's that's another important aspect of, of this. One of the things I uh, Scott, you're absolutely right about the backup. You know, testing. You need a proper strategy uh, methodologies around that. Uh, we were working with a customer the other day and um, their backups actually was part of the attack that they um, experienced were completely erased. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and it was almost like, you know, well, you should have really helped kept it somewhere else, you know, not maybe in your same network. That was probably not a good practice. It is these types of things that people are just not aware of. Yeah. And, and I think when you do have a way to respond to cyber incidents up front, it's within the company culture, it actually becomes something that's proactive and prevents you from being a victim because right. you're making changes. That's what's important. Absolutely, 100%. And that's you know, part of this order too, by the way, yeah. that you yeah. should have a plan. Yeah. I, I'd like to uh, uh, touch on something we, we covered for just a moment, just because of its significance, um, You know, which is going back to the um, executive order and its implementation. Um, you know, we we're talking about leadership and, and kind of, uh, you know, who is the right person uh, to to take this on. Um, you know, uh, Chris Krebs, you know, very well known to everyone in our audience and everything. Uh, 
He said, um, quoting here, we're on the cusp of a global pandemic. The virus causing the pandemic isn't biological. However, uh, it's software. And Mike Jones thinks that Chris would be or could be a great person to lead this. What, what do you all think about uh, Director Krebs and the experience you know, that he had and What's he doing now? If you're listening, Director Krebs, you know, if I had a bat signal, I would do it right now for you. <laughs> He's at the Aspen Institute, I understand. Oh, okay. You, you think that'd be better than being on the Cyber Hero Adventure Show? Uh, certainly not. Yeah, good, good <laughs> answer. <not. laughs> Remember, we have an editing team. <laughs> Um, so uh, these are these are really uh, great and important thoughts. I really really appreciate uh, our audience. Uh, and, and Mike uh, has just added something else here. My last two cents. Um, what is CNI? Anybody know? I, I know it stands for something important. Um, uh, it, well, anyways, uh, it's all DevOps. We're all here to learn. So, Mike, if you can let us know what that is, um, forgive me, I don't I mean, know what that is. Infrastructure, probably. Or, or, or someone can Google it while we're while <laughs> we're uh, sitting here. But um, you know, I, as we're as we're kind of uh, wrapping up here, I, um, one of the interesting things uh, that I've experienced in this rather privileged position of listening and learning from folks like you, the smartest people you know in the world real life unsung uh, cyber heroes is that you all are very humble, you know, as a group. Um, and, and it's true. You know, everybody that I've listened, I've interviewed almost a hundred people now, almost everyone has this. Um, I heard this from a general, like we serve in silence kind of uh, sensibility, culture, values, which on one hand is incredibly attractive. It's wonderful as a human being that you all have that. But on the other hand, maybe people need to know that you exist, you know, and, and maybe they don't have to be so scared, you know, and, and that, and there is, you know, uh, there are places to go for help and, and to learn, you know, and, and a apropos to this conversation, I'm going to pop up something that, that Herb uh, told me about a little bit earlier. Um, this is a blog that he writes. It's called Dead, Dead Salmon Data. I'm not sure who your branding people are. What, what's going on there with that name? <laughs> um, it's a joke. And I know I'm not supposed to do the humor. You are. But um, well, I, I, think that, I think we just got that strategy reaffirmed. <laughs> a dead Salmon Data. I mean, what? There, there, there's a, a, a journal article published about emotional uh capabilities in a salmon as measured by an MRI and uh the paper actually had a a, a serious purpose to talk about uh control groups and and comparative assessments and in, in MRIs but the the gist of it uh, on a humorous level was the dead salmon uh brain scan showed that it was uh, feeling the proper emotions in response to pictures Oh. And and it was because the data were analyzed badly, but that's the that's that's the reason for the dead salmon data. Well, there's actually more to it for our audience. I want to peel that back just for a moment. Um, Her, you know, Herb has done some rather extraordinary research uh, regarding dolphins. I don't know. Can you say anything about that or not? No, I can. I, I'm hap, happy to talk about it. I mean, we we modeled dolphin biosonar and figured out how dolphins uh, recognize targets underwater, and it's a really hard problem. Um, we were able to, for example, identify targets that were buried in mud, which before we got into the problem was uh, considered impossible to do for a sonar, but dolphins do it. So if dolphins do it, we figured out how how we could do it. Um, and uh, I learned a lot about uh, neural network modeling and a lot about dolphins, and, and uh, it, was, uh, it was a great opportunity for me. So here's a dumb question. Who's smarter, a dolphin or a salmon? Yes. <laughs> uh, that's really fun. That, that's that's really really funny. So as we're uh, kind of wrapping up, um, uh, Herb, uh, you want to share some kind of closing thoughts? You're doing some interesting stuff at Mindcast. Um, yeah. You know, well, you know, what's going on over there? 
Well, uh, we're, we're looking at all of these defenses. We're looking at all of these processes. Uh, we're looking carefully at how we fit in with this executive order. Uh, we have uh, federal customers in the U.S. and we have other governments and we have, uh, uh, com we have as customers, companies that do business with the government. So uh, I'm sure that this will, uh, will affect us. I think it's like any adjustment for, for medical reasons or security reasons, it's painful to begin with. But um, I think any company will find that in the end, it will be uh, good to have done. I took my first job because I thought it would be good to have been there, uh, not because I wanted particularly to go to that place. Well, I mean, uh, apropos to this executive order, we were, before uh, coming on air, we were you know talking about what you were doing, and, and I think you said uh, yesterday you, you know you were working on this issue you know, pertaining to, you know, the company. How, how do you help our audience understand how to synthesize this executive order in a way that they can actually take some positive steps and, and, and get yeah. stuff done? No, that's the, uh, I'm actually giving a talk at uh, a group called MOG, which is um, an international group that worries about uh, security and messaging and email and, and stuff like that next month. Um, and so that's been leading me along in, in this direction, a lot of practical things. Um, what, one of the, yeah, I, yeah, that'd be nice. Um, <laughs> wait, 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 uh, Jerry, he, he's probably only half joking. I, 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 I would guess. Um, but remind me a little bit, I'm going to make a preliminary sort of announcement, um, about a technology platform that we're building to bring together uh, thought leaders with um, uh, uh, vendors and, and, and doing business. So, Jerry, you didn't know it, but you uh, actually said something incredibly important. Sorry, <laughs> go, go ahead, Herb. So um, it's led me to think about things like adversarial learning, uh, where, where we build a system that generates attacks, a system that defends against the attacks, and, and just let those two systems fight it out for a while. We, if, if we're lucky, which, which we often are when we do adversarial learning, we'll learn new things about what potential attack vectors there are and how we can defend against them. Um, that, the idea of, of uh, zero trust, of looking within your network, not assuming that you've got, you've got uh, an, an, an impermeable, uh, marginal line of defense that will never let an intruder in, the intruders will get in. And so you have to do something that will uh, detect them after they've been in. Advanced persistent threats take about 200 days to detect. So somebody, some intruder somehow gets in, often through phishing. They'll live on your system for 200 days on average wow. before you'll even find wow. them. Wow, that's unbelievable. Because people don't look they rely on luck to be able to find them i know that's i mean if you look at the solo win scenario right it's it the, <laughs> the this concept of defense in depth came up you know many many years ago and the idea with that obviously was to you know if you break through one layer you pick it up at the next layer or the next layer or the next layer at some point down the layers you're supposed to be able to detect this and yet uh, FireEye were the only people that actually even uh, actually uh, got this so and you know how they found it? As I understand it, they found it by luck. Some guy happened to be looking at a monitor, and the same thing with the, with the hack in, in the Florida water system. Some guy happened to be looking at a monitor and said, hey, this says I'm logged in on that machine. I'm not logged in on that machine. Well, you see what's paying attention. Well, we can't re we can't rely on luck to do these things. If we can be done by luck, it could be done on purpose. And, and I guess that's the point I was making earlier was that uh, there's obviously something fundamentally wrong about the way it, things are being done today. Because I mean, look how much money people are spending on technologies, and it's not working. I mean, I mean, the the, the SolarWinds thing was clever because they used you know a novel way as a conduit to get into yes. these organizations. But so it wouldn't really matter if it was somebody clicking on a link or somebody walking through a front door or whatever the, the you know, the medium was. The fact that once they were in, nobody detected that they were even there. 
Yeah, and I, I think we can do a much better job of that. Oh, I, I th absolutely. <laughs> it yeah. just yeah. Yeah. Amazing, right? I think it's yeah, safe. I think we're all pattern oriented too, the way we do things in our lives and our jobs. And that's, I think, especially where artificial intelligence coupled with some of these uh, things in cybersecurity are powerful because they could see things that are not pattern oriented. E even if it pops it up as a flag so you can quickly investigate it, you know, Mr. Jones, he logs in at this time pretty much every day and he, he goes mm -hmm. by Starbucks and gets his coffee because his, his phone associates to the Wi-Fi access point. Those type of patterns and things are almost extremely predictable if you just sat, at, you know, like a fly on the wall and watch it. Artificial intelligence can do that in the world of cybersecurity with things very yes. effectively. And that's important yes. thing for people to realize applying it in the right areas where we tend to, as humans, we're weak at repetitive things. We can we could stamp something out a hundred times, but we, we, we get kind of sloppy after the 10th or 20th time because we don't feel challenged. That's not the case with artificial intelligence. Yes. So I think applying that technology to a lot of this and the bigger picture of this executive order, very effective. Yeah. And there's two, there's two points to that. One is you can learn what's familiar to find anomalies. Yes. Um, and and the, the other is look for the absence of information. Mm -hmm. For example, sometimes when hackers come in, they'll turn off the log. If you haven't had a log entry in an hour on something that you usually get one every 30 seconds, there's something wrong. Yeah, it's true. It is true, I think. And I, I think, think the, other, the other aspect of what you mentioned, Scott and Herb, is that uh, AI is going to allow us to scale. Because if you think of the amount of attacks each company is experiencing on a daily basis, you've got a human trying to you know, take hundreds of thousands of millions of log entries you know, consolidate that and try to make sense of it. You know, I mean, I, I know this from experience is that one person can only handle maybe uh, three or four of these in their shift. You know, that, yes. that's just, you need an army of people to be dealing yes. with these things. It's just not, it's not scalable. It's not possible. And we all know that there's just not enough resources uh, to be able to do that. So, uh, you know, the, in, the advent of using uh, AI is it never been more critical than it added is today. And and um, Ken, uh, I'm not sure, again, if you can uh, disclose this uh, publicly. I'm not sure it's announced yet, but you're doing, you know, some interesting uh, stuff uh, in the area of uh, penetration testing in, in AI. Can you yeah. share anything without... without no, no, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> just uh, just managing uh, pen testing as a, as a service is, is, is a nightmare scenario. Uh, but we have, well, we're we starting to use AI actually that's purpose built for this because it actually follows proper discipline. Everything, you know, like the uh, kill chain uh, concept, as an example. Uh, and one of the things that I love about it is that it does all the grunt work that a typical human would do that would normally take two, three, four weeks to figure out. It, it does it in an hour. And so what it allows us to do, instead of keep hiring more and more pen testers, what it does is it reduces the amount of time it takes to gather that same information, allows that pen tester to do the cool stuff. You know, I now have a bag of information that I can now uh, use to do my thing with and put my context around it. Uh, again, you know, finding good pen testers is, is, is tough. Uh, Mike made a good point. There's lots of them out there if we would just give them a chance. Uh, but in the absence of that right now, the AI is, is really, it's, it's, it's been a game changer for us. Yeah. Even if we hired every hacker, we wouldn't have enough. Uh, that's right. Uh, you know, I, <laughs> this this thing's capable of, of uh, pen testing the entire world in about a week. Mm. Right. And, and uh, you know, the point I was brought up earlier as well, that, you know, the bad guys are using this already. Well, yes. you know, I, I think this is such a significant topic that uh, we're going to do a show around uh, around this uh, topic of, you know, uh, penetration testing and, and things like that, just because of how central and how important it is and even, you know, more yes. so as we, as we go forward. And um, uh, Scott, we're going to have a, a world premiere. Um, you know, I uh, wanted to just uh, 
announce something that uh, we're doing right now. We're, we're creating, uh, starting on Monday, the Cyber Hero Network, uh, which is going to be a subscription-based platform that's going to allow uh, folks in the cybersecurity and information technology ecosystem uh, to exchange uh, services and uh, look for jobs and help one another and have great thought leadership. And on uh, June 3rd, uh, we're hosting our first micro think tank. And a micro think tank is a methodology that I used to use, you know, in my in my former life, uh, where you know we have a think tank, but it's kind of like the wisdom of the crowd. We will have uh, three uh, micro keynote speakers, each speaks for about twenty minutes, and then we have uh, the crowd uh, opine on it. And we have note takers. We we synthesize all that great information for each one of these micro think tanks. We're going to put out a beautiful white paper, you know, that represents the level of, of, uh, of thinkers that uh, we're privileged to be associated with. We're going to create cool videos, which distill this complicated information into things that people can get their heads around and distribute socially, you know, around the world and, and do something good there. Um, and so um, I wanted uh, as a little way of saying, thank you, uh, Scott, he, he didn't really know I'm about to do what I'm going to be doing but to you and bob schiff over at uh cyberlytica i'm gonna uh, see if i can get this to work to show this kind of cool commercial this is like our first sort of commercial um i'll just play like the first bit of it uh but then uh, scott you can tell people uh where they can see it so uh welcome to the first sponsor commercial in the cyber hero adventure show yay <laughs> All right, on a scale of one to 10, how cool is that? Come on, round of applause for Scott. And, uh, who, you know, you know and, and the only thing I would sort of add, you know, as a marketer is if you order now, you get a set of Ginsu Kitchen Knives. They slice, they dice, they, they can cut a tomato can and still be sharp, sharp enough to cut a tomato. And 20 um, years later, you still can't yeah. cook on it. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, Scott, where do uh, people go to see the, the the whole video? It's really great. Congratulations, by oh, the way. Man, thank you. Yeah, yeah. We're working and partnered with uh, Cyberlytica, which is doing some great stuff. They're, they're really uh, focuses in dark web auditing and help people stay safe, but they've got a whole slew of services in the world of cyber that are kind of niche and help solve complex problems, but affordably. Um, so if they go to cyberlytica.com, they could learn more about it. The video is posted up there and certainly on YouTube as well. And then on my website as well, scottshober.com. Super, thanks. And uh, Ken, Ken, you're going to have the last word. Oh, no, I, uh, this was a great uh, subject today. Very, very important. I'm really happy to see somebody finally somewhere in the world actually taking this stuff seriously. Uh, <laughs> this has been a slow burn. Um, <laughs> I always, you know, the, the thing that always, always amazes me is that the way people kind of refer to what's going on right now as a, a crisis. Um, it's like, hello, <laughs> this started like decades ago. Um, you know, a paranoia was kind of up here, but it's been taking this very slow meandering process for people to, to get to a point where they're not just aware, but are also accepting of the fact that this is a problem. Well, and I the only thing true. I would add to that is paranoia is an unfounded concern. So maybe we can change that to call it like hypervigilant or something. Mm -hmm. But there is a basis uh, for all this stuff. Speaking <laughs> of which, I, I said uh, early on in the show that uh, I was going to try to uh, show you a use case of a 64-year-old man in a superhero costume. This is at your local Best Buy. Take a look.
Well, we're going to the return area. Okay. So here we go. It's easy peasy to recycle at Best Buy. <laughs> Mission accomplished. I mean, you know, I don't know if, uh, what the uh, swearing policies are on an internet show, but I think my wife thinks I'm batshit. Um, and I, I can't imagine why. Well, so on... <laughs> somebody needs to leave. <laughs> well, you know, on, on that note, uh, on behalf of a grateful digital universe, uh, Herb, Scott, Ken, our wonderful audience, thank you so much for who you are and what you do and uh, that you toil in anonymity. And I hope in some uh, small way, this helps uh, elevate the community uh, in terms of thought leadership. Uh, because a rising tide does lift all ships. So uh, stay tuned, everybody. We'll see you again soon. Thanks, Gary. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Gary. Thanks, Herb. Thanks, Ken.